3. The Economics of Population Control From one perspective, it can be argued that the title of this chapter is clearly wrong, that instead of economics, it should read The Politics of Population Control. Clearly, it is political action that is involved, political action by the state to control population through one means or another. By means of legislation and force, the state exercises its power over the population to control their behaviour and their rate of birth. On the other hand, the behaviour of the state, while obviously political action, increasingly constitutes its economic programme. The failure of the socialist state to control the economic order successfully and productively leads to a continual and inescapable economic crisis. The socialist state is less and less able to feed its people, less and less able to govern production successfully, and therefore increasingly unable to institute economic planning which has any reasonable correspondence to reality. This is the area of first effort, to control production and to direct it to a planned goal. But production and the plan fail to correspond. The plan can be altered and often is, without appreciable results. But the fact of planning is not altered or abandoned. Thus, two basic ingredients of the socialist order, the plan or planning and production, reach a stalemate. Every effort to increase production continues to be made, but attention is given also to the third area, consumption. Consumption, like production, is already controlled, but it becomes subject to further controls. If the supply of food and materials is insufficient, the production fails to meet the demands by consumers. It is not the plan, but the consumers who are at fault. As a result, the consumers must be controlled still further. Consumer control thus becomes a basic part of the plan in the socialist state. The control of the consumer takes several directions. First, the control of money is basic to the control of the consumers, of the people. Money being the lifeblood of the economic system, the control of money means that the economic life of the people is controlled. It is popular in prosperous times for otherwise intelligent men to remark foolishly that you can't eat gold, but it needs to be observed by way of answer that you can't eat very long without it. Money buys food and very few people can hope to exist long without money to feed themselves. Real money is gold and silver. Paper money is checkbook money at best. Just as a cheque reads, pay to the order of, so valid paper money reads, payable to the bearer on demand, a specified sum in gold or silver. A person who issues cheques beyond his ability to pay is guilty of fraud. A state which issues paper money beyond its gold and silver reserves is similarly guilty of fraud. The state, moreover, has the power to force its citizen victims to accept the fraud. Total control of a people is possible through control of money, and after World War II, the United States used special issues of paper currencies made obligatory and mandatory in occupied Central Europe, its means of total control with a minimum of effort. Socialist orders, planning states, are thus entirely favourable to a purely fiat currency, to an unbacked paper money. Without such a monetary system, their totalitarian power is broken. Since gold and silver make possible an independent wealth, since their intrinsic worth escapes the control of the state and the effort of the state to make itself the sole source of value, Speaking before the Financial Conference of the National Industrial Conference Board in New York, February 14th, 1968, William McChesney Martin, Jr., Chairman, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, declared, I have been quoted as saying that gold is a barbarous metal, but it is not gold that is barbarous. That wasn't my point. Quite the contrary. Gold is a beautiful and noble metal. What is barbarous when it occurs is man's enslavement to gold for monetary purposes. From Martin's perspective, gold is barbarous as the monetary standard. His use of the term barbarous is both revealing and a knowledgeable use. The word comes from the Latin barbarus, which was derived from the Greek barbaros, which had the connotation of both foreign and slavish. Martin used it in the latter sense. For Martin, gold is enslaving. 
and he speaks of man's enslavement to gold for monetary purposes, because for Martin, freedom is slavery, and slavery is freedom. Gold frees the individual from the arbitrary paper money of the state, and paper money frees the state from the control of the people and places the people in the state's power. Gold enslaves the state to fiscal responsibility, but the modern state wants essentially a free state and a slave people. Gold is a roadblock to this goal. The second means of controlling the population is also an economic means of control, wage and price controls. A traveller to the Soviet Union in 1967 observed, Rents for executives in the government run from $6 to $16 a month. On the other hand, one can very easily spend $6 for a single meal in the evening, namely one month's rent. Jet fuel is sold within Russia at $3.50 a tonne and aviation gasoline at $4.50 a tonne. On the other hand, a white shirt costs $12. How can one equate this kind of economy to American standards? It's impossible. By controlling prices totally, the socialist state controls the population. It can make its production largely unavailable by pricing its goods beyond the ability of the people to buy. Cars, shirts, jewellery, anything the state cannot produce can be priced out of reach, and the limited production is matched to a low limited consumption. In the Soviet Union, income taxes are not necessary. Total control of wages and prices makes such a step unnecessary, as does a fiat currency, which is, in itself, a form of income and inheritance control. The wage controls give the states the power to manipulate the population. Wages can be increased to encourage the people, and prices also increase to limit their spending power. Through wage and price controls, the planners are able to correlate production and consumption a little more effectively. As a result, wage and price controls become a necessary instrument of population control. The people, with their unpredictable and unplanned desires, that is, not planned by a central agency, upset socialist calculations. Because the principle of planning is assumed to be correct, the answer is that the selfish consumption of the people is to blame for the economic crisis caused by the failure of the plan. The result is wage and price controls, plus a program of, quote, re-educating, end quote, the people. But the crisis of socialism deepens. The economic control of the population by means of controlling production and consumption is not enough. As a result, a third instrument becomes necessary. Birth control in the broadest sense, the control of the producers and consumers' birth. It is commonly assumed that birth control is primarily a personal and familial matter, but such an assumption sees the situation without reference to the political order. Ideally, birth control is a personal and private concern, a moral decision for each couple to make. Realistically, it is now essentially a political concern, a basic tool in the economics of population control. Directly or indirectly, a major part of the research and propaganda is financed by the state, and the results are then publicised by the state. Control of births by state action is not new, no more than pollution and depletion of natural resources. Man's abuse of the earth rests on an irreligious exploitation of it, and it is no less common in simpler cultures, sometimes more common, than in advanced ones. Thus we read concerning Laos. The New York State Air Pollution Control Board's Progress Report announced that there is a semi-permanent inversion over a large segment of Laos. Mountain farmers, having exhausted one piece of land, can do nothing but burn off another patch of jungle. As a result, the smoke gets thicker until, just before the summer monsoon knocks it down, it often extends up to 10,000 feet, with visibility seldom over 3,000. The so-called noble Greeks, long before Plato and Aristotle, had stripped Greece of its fine forests, and Greece's problem then was not too many people, but too wrong a faith. All the same, because Plato's perspective was statist, his planning for man included population control by means of birth regulations. Only people within certain age groups, women between 20 and 40, men between 25 and 55, were to be permitted to have children. Children born out of those years were to be disposed of, if not previously aborted. 
Leto did not foresee a problem of overpopulation. His concern was with the power of the state to plan totally. The right to bear children was thus seen as totally within the state's jurisdiction and a legitimate area of state planning, since the children are being reared, quote, for the state, end quote. Thus, long before overpopulation was ever heard of, population control by means of restrictions on birth was a part of social planning. The rise of Christianity forced the abandonment of all such controls. But, in recent years, the aggressive revival of humanism has again made such controls on births a major factor in planning. We are indeed assured that world socialization will give us effective population planning. According to a United States agency, a new process is about to begin, or has perhaps already started, and the first signs of that, quote, socialization, end quote, of the world, which appear on the horizon, may be significant in this connection. A group of American scientists and research sponsored by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Cambridge, Massachusetts, with the support of the Carnegie Corporation, have predicted for the year 2000, the millennium, the decline of the family and of woman's place in the home, except for those couples designated to breed children. According to another report, the married couple of the future may need a special permit to have children, according to H. Bentley Glass, professor of biology at Johns Hopkins University. Penalty for having an illegitimate or unlicensed child should be sterilization, he said. The right to have children can't remain unlimited, Dr. Glass said Tuesday at County Museum. This is because the increase in world population is the second most serious threat to mankind. The most serious is nuclear war. Dr. Glass, in an interview before giving the last of the spring lectures sponsored by the museum's Science and History Alliance, said permits for a first and second child would be easy to get from the licensing agency. If a couple passed, they would be issued a marriage license. The right to the first child would be automatic, and the family would even get a tax exemption. A second child would be licensed too, although there would not be a second exemption. Instead of gaining an exemption for the third child, even if licensed, a couple would have $600 added to their taxable income. Dr. Glass said penalties for producing an unlicensed baby would be severe. He suggested sterilization as a punishment to fit the crime. The time may even come when reproduction is entirely separated from sex, with both sperm and ova kept in laboratories and matched up there by technicians. I do not advocate this, Dr. Glass said, but it is a possible or probable development. He predicted that the grosser differences among men, such as racial colouring, will disappear within the next 2,000 years or so, but that individual differences will remain. The Negro population within the United States is probably already 30% white and will disappear entirely, he said. Plans for such radical control of population appear widely in the press, in scientific journals and in popular periodicals. The people are steadily being prepared to believe that there is an overpopulation problem and that radical controls are necessary. Thus, Dr. Sam McClatchy, MD, believes that Quote, social man, end quote, must face radical and total control by the state, the United Nations specifically, over birth. The scientific means for such control are very nearly available, we are told. Vaccination against conception. I am assuming that several generations from now, there has been no major war and extreme overcrowding is the problem of the day. Struggling desperately with the task, the United Nations have finally come together and brought forth a Bill of Survival Rights, backed by the power of the United Nations countries, creeds and races. Vaccination against conception, long banned in many areas, is now legal and, in fact, compulsory. To preserve the rights of the individual, all persons, except those obviously unfit by reason of severe hereditary, mental or physical defect, would be allowed to reproduce themselves, that is, each couple might have two children. After achieving this, most would be vaccinated. Certain males of superior qualifications, if married to equally acceptable wives, would be allowed to have large families. If their wives were unacceptable, artificial insemination from these males into suitable women, probably with consent of their unsuitable husbands with some sort of compensation for their wounded pride,
might be done. Stored semen from great men of the past could be used in specially selected cases. An extension of this idea, which would infringe more on our cherished right of selection, would be to refuse marriage licenses to those considered unsuitable, or give them conditional licenses in which the number of children allowed, either natural or by insemination, would be a part of the contract. One further advance in knowledge, the transplantation of ova from one female to another, and possibly the storage of ova, would enable us to preserve the characteristics of desirable women as well. Such transplants have already been done in animals. The effect on the ugly duck mother of producing a swan I leave to the psychiatrists and the authors of New Children's Fairy Tales. Nothing is more audacious in McClatchy's statement than his reference to preserving, quote, the rights of the individual, end quote. Other scientists hold to the elimination of undesirable elements in the population, and by this the politically and religiously undesired are meant, that is, the over-principled. A Columbia University professor recently stated that 15% of the over-principled population should be encapsulated. This means locked up in mental hospitals, perhaps to be rendered harmless by a free lobotomy. While lobotomy is a permanent don't-care pill administered with a knife. This is, in principle, no different from Pharaoh's attempt to destroy all Israelite males at birth and thus eliminate the race. From that time to the present, totalitarianism has used population control extensively. Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich of Stanford has declared that the ideal population of the United States would be 150 million, 50 million less than the 200 million at the time he made these statements. On what grounds a population figure represents a desirable population is, of course, an entirely subjective judgment. The planners themselves cannot always agree on whether there is a need for more or less people. They are agreed on the necessity for control. In practice, however, planners have both encouraged and discouraged population growth. Red China for a time sought to increase the birth rate. Later, a desperate effort began to reduce the population, which may already have been reduced by famine and purges. Various fantastic, quote, remedies, end quote, for fertility, including the eating of tadpoles as an oral contraceptive and the separation of couples, have been used. From the Soviet Union, conflicting reports appear expressing both Soviet official concern over the growth of the population and official dismay over the declining birth rate. In the Soviet Union, there is both official action to promote birth control and limit population, and also to reward an increased birth rate. In connection with the effort to reward birth, an amusing episode occurred in 1965. A recent news report told about Russia's unwed mother who won the Mother Heroine Award for 1965 by giving birth to her tenth child. After the award was duly presented amid great acclaim, the, quote, Soviet Russia, end quote, newspapers exposed her as an unwed mother who indeed had born ten children, each from a different man. Eight of the ten had been turned over to state homes and the two at home, whom the state was supporting, were literally starving because the woman and her present lover were spending the kids' support money on vodka. The Soviet press says the error happened because no one bothered to check up on her. The newspaper says, Blasphemy has been performed over the sacred word mother. In East Europe also, we are told, there is a declining population. In Romania, the declining birth rate led officials to decree that abortions, previously promoted, be illegal and within a year, officials were claiming a, quote, baby boom, end quote. In Yugoslavia, however, abortions continue in state clinics, and some women have up to 40 abortions in a lifetime, with the country's total annual abortions numbering 500,000, and the births 400,000. Now, can we reconcile these contradictory efforts at increase and limitation, encouragement and discouragement of birth, when both occur at the same time in one country, as in the Soviet Union, what is the cause? The problem lies in the plan. The scientific plan fails to bend to reality, and therefore reality is forced to conform to the plan. 
The planners include men who need more slave labour, that is, socially controlled labour, to fulfil their plans, and also men who must feed that labour. More production is needed, hence more babies to provide labour for production. There is a lack of food and materials for consumption by the labour force, that is, there is overconsumption in relation to the supply, hence reduce the number of the consumers. Thus, one division of planners needs more workers, another division wants fewer mouths to feed. Since socialism fails in its attempt to manage production and consumption with the existing population, its next step becomes the production of more producing labourers and the limitation of consuming workmen by birth controls. Socialism, thus, veers from one solution to the other, depending on which set of planners is most in favour. There is still a fourth aspect of the economics of population control which deserves attention, state planning of vocations. The planning economy finds itself unable to cope with supply and demand, and it seeks to meet the requirements of a functioning economy by moving people to new jobs, or in a variety of ways using direct or indirect coercion to direct labour in the planned channels. In a free economy, there is a natural flow of labour to necessary areas in terms of price or wage incentives. Men move from job to job in terms of higher pay, and the higher pay is possible because a heavy demand for goods in that area means greater profits. A movement of labour is necessary in any economy. The planned economy replaces the profit and wage incentive with force. Thus, we are told that, by means of taxation and subsidies, the President L.B. Johnson farm plan called for the, quote, liquidation, end quote, of 2.4 million farmers. The number one U.S. farm problem, how to liquidate some 2.4 million farmers. In 20 years, even with all the government's help for agriculture, there has been, quote, liquidation, end quote, of 2.6 million farmers, that is, these farmers have left the land. But the exodus from farms, it appears, is only half completed at this point. The White House takes the view that only 1 million efficient farmers could produce all US farm needs. Today, there are 3.4 million farmers. Thus, according to the White House, there are 2.4 million unneeded farmers. President Johnson and his budget director, Kermit Gordon, both have spelled out the administration's goal in dealing with farm problems. We are indeed told by experts who plan on the highest level that the world's small farms must go. Paris, AP, agricultural ministers of North America and Western Europe, agreed Thursday that tiny plots must be merged into economically sound farmlands in order to improve agricultural income. Meeting as the Agricultural Committee on the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, the ministers said these, quote, structural adjustments would help reduce the need for price supports and protection and thus facilitate a general trade in farm produce. The contradictions in such planning have been well described by D.P. Van Gorder in Ill Fares the Land, 1966. But contradictions mean nothing to the planners. In the communist countries, the redistribution of labour is forcibly accomplished, but coercion to alter the economic scene is increasingly common everywhere. We have cited the four basic aspects of the economics of population control. Although these are all politically motivated and directed, they are clearly economic in impact and purpose. A fifth aspect of population control, while also politically motivated and directed, is not economic. It is, however, basic, and it is the necessary precondition to the other four modes of control. This is the destruction of Christian orthodoxy, the attack on biblical faith. These four methods of population control were common to antiquity. Their slow retreat began with the growth of biblical faith and the development of the implications of biblical religion. Science, as the new hope of man, undergirds the returning controls. The elite scientific planners, as the new gods of creation, are increasingly entrusted with more and more religious authority over man. In the new morality, man is the prime experimental animal and is to be used, bred and moved as the elite planners determine. The growing surrender to the planners is a religious surrender. It is grounded in the popular assumption that the planners can lead man into paradise on earth. 
To counteract this religious surrender, a religious resistance is necessary 